All right, Roy, I think we're a few minutes in, so let's just be tone down the music and um, we actually get down to business. Let's do it. All right, so welcome, folks. This is um, yeah, this is our uh, webinar about where we're going to learn about how to diagnose with the market issues in a SaaS scaling business. We have a few people uh, of Winning by Design in uh, in the call today, but especially Roe. Um, I've got Roe here with me, who's one of our most seasoned uh, revenue architects. Dominique is here as well, our CEO. I'm currently I'm Harry, based in Belgium, leading the. Um, uh, heading up the revenue architecture team. Um, and I want to get us started with a simple quote, one of my favorite quotes. So if we can go to the next slide. So why start with a diagnose? So Einstein actually said, if I had one hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 mis minutes diagnosing the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. Um, I absolutely love that quote because I think it's very much applicable in real life. For all the people in the house here who have a healthy long-term relationship, you all know this is a very important rule to live by whenever you're having discussions. Or if you're like me, you have three kids, your house is an eternal mess. This one helped me solve all my problems. For months in a row, we discussed my wife and I like, our house is a mess. You should clean up more. No, I should clean up more. No, we should have an extra maid. Actually, after a few months, we realized we just didn't understand the problem. We just didn't invest enough time to educate, motivate our kids to clean up after them. Once we understood this, our life changed completely. Our house has never been so clean. So that is a beautiful quote. And it applies very much in the same way for when you're um, diagnosing a recurring revenue business. So below you can actually see um, the, the winning by design approach. A lot of customers come to us to you know, either design their processes for an enterprise sales motion, an ABM campaign, or, um, or their CS process, or activate this with their teams, or train their reps on how to be very good at uh, diagnosing or, or giving really sharp demos, and how to reinforce that with coaching. Those are all very, very big efforts. And so in order to know where you want to leverage those efforts, the minimal amount of effort for the maximum amount, maximum amount of impact, the first thing you want to do is make sure you get a really, really strong grip on the problem. And this is where the diagnosis starts. So for today, and if you can go to the next slide, I want to double click on that, uh, the diagnose piece. Yes. So the agenda for today, we're going to follow actually these five simple steps. And these five simple steps are the very same steps as we would diagnose the customer's problem. So the first part is always try to defining the problem. In order to do that, you're going to have to start by collecting data. With that data, this is going to help you identify some hypotheses and trying to find some causal factors. With all of these hypotheses and testing these hypotheses, you will actually able to finally conclude the root cause of the issue. Once you have the root cause, this is going to be the moment finally where we're going to be able to start thinking about solutions and start the heavy lifting of, of, of implementing those. So, Roy, why don't you take us through step number one, defining the problem? Thanks, Harry. All right, let's define a problem. Now, usually clients come to us with a problem. It's almost in every case, it's about, it's related to growth, right? Up until two years ago, we had some companies that come to us and told us we're growing too fast or we grew too fast. We never really focused on, on the processes and getting people up to scale because skills because our sales rep were so good. Oh, sorry, because our product was so good, we didn't focus on our sales rep. But nowadays we know that the market is changing. Most of our clients come to us with declining metrics, whether it's revenue, whether it's win rate, whether retention rates, these are the types of uh, uh, pro uh, problems that we encounter. Today's session, we're gonna follow uh, uh, with this use case. So this is CEO and this is what he told us. Our growth has stalled. Our churn has increased. Some reps do reach their targets, but most of them don't. And I really feel that we need to solidify our position in the market. That's going to be our use case for today. But before that, we need to talk about problems and root causes, right? And to do that, we're going to use the RSA uh, tree diagram, 
right? In the middle, we have a problem, could be any sort of problem, but we want to separate between the symptoms and the root causes, right? If you're not focusing on the root causes, if you're not addressing the root causes, right? It's like treating a toothache with Tylenol, Tylenol. You need really, you really need to focus on the root cause in, in order to really improve. And this is what uh, uh, we have here. So let's do a quick exercise. Here are different uh, things that we hear or find. Let's call them the findings. And I'll read them out for you. Uh, performance, 80% of our reps, 80% uh, of our revenue comes from three of our reps. Go to market, you're applying the wrong go to market motion. Retention, churn has been increasing. Retention is decreasing. You have yet, yet to establish a repeatable and effective process. And in terms of skills, your skills are under par. Your rep skills are under par. Let's do this exercise. Which one are the symptoms? Which one are the problems? And which one are the root causes? Can you write in the chat? Enough, to, enough talking about and chatting about kids and messy, messy houses. <laughs> what are the symptoms, the things that we can see? What are the problems and what are the root causes? Feels root causes, rep performance in the symptoms. Yeah, I agree. Cool. I'm not looking for right answers. I just want you guys to start thinking of how would you structure that. This is how we structured uh, this, for example, right? So performance and retention, usually those are the numbers that those are the symptoms. But they are because in this case, we have two problems because we don't have a repeatable process on one side. And on the other side, our reps are not skilled to do what they're expected to do. But the root cause of all this is that we're applying the wrong go-to-market motion. And we don't understand that. So that's how we focus on the problem. Let's talk about how we collect the data, which is step number two. Yes, absolutely. So, so before you want to start analyzing the data, do you want to start collecting, the, sorry, analyzing the problem, you want to collect the data? And this is where we see you, you want to work with really two dimensions of data, and they work together like sort of yin and, and yang, right? So first part, the quantitative data, second part, the qualitative data. So on the quantitative data, that's everything that has numbers, like financial metrics, performance metrics, go-to-market metrics, conversion rates, AR per rep. You're going to spend a lot of time in spreadsheets, in pivot tables, all of that sort. And um, that is fantastic because it is very fact-based, right? It's also very efficient to work with data. Um, data also has a few limitations. Data can give you a lot of knowledge, but it's very hard to get insights out of data without the qualitative part. I think another limitation that we also see, you do need to have a sample size, which is big enough, right? Once you have that, you go to the qualitative data. And this is usually through interviews. You're gonna to listen to, to rep calls and try to see what, what is happening there in, in client meetings. You're gonna read emails that go in and out. You're gonna look at the process, analyze sort of the process. Now, the problem is if you have qualitative data alone, that's always where, that, that has the danger to be very biased and based on opinion, right? But once you actually get to put those two together, this is where usually when you start to see like the complete, the complete truth in front of you. Now I want to double click also on a, on a couple of focus areas. Now what you see here in front of you is a pyramid with seven focus areas. Um, if you're diagnosing a recurring revenue businesses, these are generally going to be the focus areas where you, you really want to um, dig in a little bit deeper. So it's going to be on the go-to-market model, processes, technology, enablement, skills, and org. And why is this pyramid very useful? Because it also, it starts to give us an indication of causality. Generally, what we see is that if you look at the data, that is going to tell you which go-to-market model needs to be followed. Once you know the go-to-market model, that's going to dictate which processes that needs to be established. 
that's going to dictate which technology you can actually use to enhance these processes. It's going to dictate what is the enablement you need, and that is going to dictate the skills that, that you're actually going to need to fulfill that, and that's going to finally tell you what are the types of people that we actually need to be able to perform those skills. So that is also a very helpful way to sort of structure the data as it starts to sort of point towards causality. Roy, I'm going to give it back to you. So now we're, we have collected the data, let's start to identify the causal factors, all right? Here is when we go back to the revenue architect uh, uh, basics. We're starting off with the growth model. For those of you who are familiar with the revenue architect uh, models, the growth formula basically says that a thriving recurring revenue business progresses through four distinct stages. The startup phase, up until roughly the 10 million point, that scale up could be 100, could be an IPO, could be maybe 150. But this is where you stop doing uh, what doesn't work and focus only on what works. And you do that efficiently and effectively. Once you do that, in the past, we used to say this is like the IPO, but nowadays uh, we don't have IPOs. At some point, you transition into a grown-up stage, right? This is where you want to win the right customers. You focus on efficiency and productivity. And at some point, you become an enterprise and Microsoft, Adobe of the world. This is where that $1 billion and growth basically um, plateaus, right? In our case, our company is where the blue dot is around that 12 million, which indicates that they're probably in, have begun or are beginning that transition from that startup phase to a scale-up phase. Now, and that's a very big change for the company, culture-wise, process-wise, people-wise. This is really a dramatic change that a company um, uh, has to go through. Now, with that knowledge, we can start honing in on common challenges challenges that we see at that specific point. Yeah, so what you actually see here is the beginning of that growth curve, right? Where we actually see the moment that you start going from startup to scale up, from scale up to grown up, you need to, you need to have nailed really these following milestones if you really want to have an, an optimal growth path, so to say, right? Where it starts in the early days by making sure you get your pricing and packaging in order, then usually it transitions to founder-led uh, sales motion and so forth and so forth all the way up to, to, to grown up or even, even beyond that, right? So if you look back at our use case, right? We know that they are somewhere in between startup and scale up. So what I would say a perfect company at that moment should have um, should have had is the data model, go-to-market model, and the repeatable process. But this is actually where we see a lot with our clients that this is one of the most common problems, right? Although that the revenue is sometimes at 10 million, sometimes at 20 million, sometimes 40, 50 million, that some of these steps were either skipped or they had nailed it, but something had changed and they need to realign back on that step. So the three most common problems, right, that we often see is that either they don't have a common data model, right? And that can mean it's either we are not measuring it or yes, we can measure it, but it's taking us hours to combine it from different systems. And there's no sort of leadership dashboard that is, look, that, that is presented with the leadership on a weekly basis, looking at that common data model. I think another thing that we often very, see very often is launching too many go-to-market motions too early. Um, so just as a rule of thumb, I, I know, I imagine many people here in the house know this, but um, if you're not a 10 million ARR, don't start a second go-to-market motion. We generally recommend, you, you, can, you don't have to, but you can start a second go-to-market motion once you're getting to 15, 20 million ARR and a third one once you're closer to 30, right? Um, third problem that we often see is that sometimes when, when the growth is so dynamic that you know, there hasn't been attention to really nail it into sort of a repeatable process. 
I think you know those are not the only challenges, but I would say those are the most common problems that we see even with clients that you know are already in the scale up or sometimes even grown up phase. All right, so back to our use case. We don't know which one of the three. We're just uh, assuming right now that that is probably the area that we need to look into. Um, so in order to do that, let's move to the second model, which is the data model. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the data model, it is visualized as a bow tie, superimposing a uniform layer of metrics on the customer journey. In our case, let's say this is the, uh, the company's metrics and they are measuring prospects. In this case, last quarter, let's say it's the last quarter, they had 17,800 prospects coming into their website. 3,000 of them reached a certain threshold and became MQLs. From those MQLs, SALs, uh, 666. And then we entered the discovery call, 619. 68 of those uh, turned into paying customers, which is equivalent of 5.1 million. Overall, the ARR starting that period was 12 million. At the end of that period, it was 9.4. You can already see where we're going with this. This should ring a, a bell here. And lifetime value is equivalent to 43 with these numbers. Now, how, how many of these metrics do you know uh, about your business? Do you measure these sort of uh, metrics? Yeah, maybe let's ask it to the crowd in a certain percent. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I mean. I want uh, to see. With a certain percentage, right? Uh, do, do you measure 100% of these, 80% of these? Okay, we've got a few nods in the audience. 100%. Cool. Fantastic. That is a good start. But Beth, guys, let me, all you yeses, is it following the bow tie or just uh, your own data model that you invented? That's the question. All right. Uh, of course, it doesn't matter, right? As long as you have a data model, we believe that this is a good representation that is relevant for all recurring revenue businesses. All right. So let's go back to our use case. We don't look at volume metrics when we do our analysis, we focus on the conversion metrics. Why? Because it allows us to focus on performance and efficiency rather than pure volume. In our case, you can see here, number of prospects that turned uh, the conversion rate to MQLs is 17%. We call the CR1. CR2 is 22%, reaching that discovery call. From discovery call to a closed one, to becoming a, a customer, it's 11%. That's our win rate. CR5 is activated, so that's 100%. In our case, uh, this company uh, doesn't have a real problem there. Onboarding, onboarding that is uh, ends with that first impact. We're reaching 95%. Retention is 78, all right? We always already saw that problem in the volume when we look at volumes. And expansion is only 6%. The next step is we want to look and benchmark to industry peers. What you see here is this is a, a joint venture between Winning by Design and Bench Sites. We're building a new updated repository and a database of these metrics that we just talked about. Sari will put uh, in the chat a link to bench uh, to bench mic. Bench sites. This is an open source. You can log in and review the bench, uh, the benchmarks uh, and the numbers. What we ask in return, by the way, is for to you guys to help us uh, enrich that database. And we're going to ask you anonymously to add your company's uh, metrics. Uh, we're right now at around uh, 400. Our goal is to reach 1,000 by the end of the year, and we need your help to get there. So, yeah. Back to that. Industry benchmark offers a general understanding of performance, but by, uh, by na nature, it lacks the level of accuracy to operate that we need to operate a recurring revenue factory. Having said that, let's see how we can use it and where it is helpful. So the blue one is our company's conversion rates. On top of that, I laid, I went to the site and I laid, these are actually numbers for that ACV level. And you can see here the numbers. 
let me ask you, I see the chat is active, but I want to ask you in the chat, what are the areas that you think is worth for us to zoom in right now? You can call it uh, CR1s to, to eight. Where will you double click and focus on? What will be our next step? CR4, CR7, eight. That's right. Let's start off with uh, CR4 because that's our next slide, right? So yeah, uh, CR4, follow-up question. CR4 is the win rate from discovery call to a closed one. Possible problems and causes that the win rate is almost half of industry benchmark. Win rate is dramatically low. Inefficient discovery, I like that, bad demos. Seller skills, let's put everything under seller skills. Remember Harry's pyramid skill is one thing, so that's one thing that we probably would want to look into. Value proposition, wrong ICP, that's always a problem, right? We're talking to the wrong people, which causes low win rates. Targeted industries, yeah, same thing as ICP. Price too high, Wilson, yeah. I hear a lot of salespeople uh, blaming that our pricing is not competitive enough. Um, product, of course. This is the constant beat between sales and, and product, right? The product is not mature enough. If you don't have the right features, we're losing to competition. All great questions, but I like uh, all great ideas. Let's zoom in on performance because usually that's the first, on, on skills and performance because usually that's where we zoom in first. Uh, a regular analysis that we do in every engagement is uh, when we see a problem with CR4 is to look at individual reps performance. And when we did this here, each line represents uh, a rep a sales uh, AE, for example, and how much, um, how much new revenue they attained. What we uncovered here is that 80% of the revenue is coming from 35% of the reps, make five in this case, and only two are actually hitting their quota. The rest of this sales force is generating only 20%. That's a big red light, right? And again, coming back, it's probably a skill issue. But let's park this and zoom, go up again and try to look at other uh, problems that we see here. For those of you who like to do these number crunching, another advanced performance metric and analysis that we do is combining both CRs. In this case, let, let's look at CR3 and CR4. CR3 is the conversion of a discovery call, that first discovery slash qualification call, and CR4 is the win rate. CR3 is above the benchmark. It's relatively high. That means more uh, deals past the discovery stage than what is probably the norm, the industry norm. Mm -hmm. But the win rate is relatively low. Is, it's not relatively, it's very low, right? And with this combination, we have this two by two metrics, and this is where we start to analyze what is happening. In our case, CR3 is above benchmark and CR4 is below benchmark, which indicates that we have a problem in the discovery and the diagnostic part of the process. Specifically here, we identify that it's a skill problem. And our solution here is to train the sellers to diagnose and uh, on priority and do a better job there and open less opportunities and, and filter more opportunities there. Again, let's park. So we reached one end. Let's go back up. I want to analyze CR7. Another great analysis that we like to do is looking at trends. So not benchmarking yourself against industry peers but against yourself. So we take each one of those CRs, each one of those volumes and track the trend line, either if we have the data eight quarters back or four quarters back, and we'd like to see the trend line, what is happening there. 
what we see here is that they used to have great retention rates, CR7, but it has been dropping. So something happened in Q, Q3 or even Q2 of 22. Any ideas? Again, we're just coming up with hypotheses here. What could happen here? What can cause retention rate to drop? Product issue, right? Could be the existing product or somebody, we introduce new products or new features and they're not uh, good enough for our customers. Closing wrong customers, we, yeah, we see that a lot, right? Sellers are good sellers. They're selling uh, to the, our wrong ICP. They get the product. They don't really know what to do with it. Um, lack of recurring impact, of course, that's, uh, that's always uh, the problem. Prioritizing high risks. Hey, John, good to see you there. Uh, pandemic ended, yeah, for a lot of us. So less money to spend. Uh, everybody uh, is feeling that right now. Uh, and competitors, right? Maybe in Q2 or Q3, a competitor came in and, and undercut our prices. Of course, that's also a possibility. We like to split that into two areas, external factors, which you guys talked about, end of the pandemic, uh, the market changed, competition, and internal factors. We introduce a new product, new features, something happened with the product. Um, we change a process and it's not working or the team structure has changed. What we did find out is that it's not any one of those uh, problems that we saw. Let's see how we got to the next one. Yes, so this is where it's getting exciting, right? So we've been through the growth model, the data model, data analysis. I think the more models that we start to collate on each other, the more we're really starting to, to understand the root cause. And I think the next part is looking at the go-to-market model. So I think a lot of you in the room are familiar with this model. For the folks um, who don't, what you're actually seeing here is on the X axis, you have these numbers, 5K, 15K, 50K, and so forth. This is where you want to have your ACV. And depending on your ACV, there's going to be an optimum way to sell to those type of clients. Those type of clients for a particular ACV, they expect a certain experience. And we as business, right, we can only put X amount of people or product or efforts on it to sell that, to still be somewhat profitable. So that is where the go-to-market model comes in, to really make sure that the way we sell fits with the ACV, right? So um, maybe quick, quick uh, little question from the crowd. So where is your business more or less? Are you folks in no touch, low touch, medium touch, high touch, or dedicated touch? So no touch, this is generally more product that grows type of motion. One stage means you only have salespeople, no SDRs. Two stage meaning you have SDRs doing outbound and a little bit of inbound, um, passing it over to sales. Then high touch is usually going to be more ABM pro programs with, with uh, field sales and so forth and so forth. Okay. So no that... KLG companies in the crowd? Mm -hmm. Dave, we need to do something about it. Ah, Frank. Frank is there. Okay. KLG. Okay. Hi, Frank. <laughs> All right, so we got a we got a few quite some high. Oh, another PLG, two more PLGs here. All right, so for the the folks who are in the PLG motion, definitely be good friends with Dave Boyce here uh, with us. Um, he's a tremendous source of uh, wisdom when it comes to PLG. So um, here we go to the the, the next slide. So, right, so back to our client case. Um, we have that go to market model, and we want to establish where they are. Now we've actually. First, we want to sort of learn what are those motions. And the way you do that is simply by looking at processes, you look at interviews, you look at their org charts. Usually, the way the, the, the titles of the roles you're going to see. Okay. Okay. Mute rule. There we go. Sorry, rule. Um, back to our, uh, our um, go to market model. So through interviews, through process and identification, you want to understand like, hey, what motion are they after? In the case of our company there, um, we're actually seeing that they are using a two-state motion. So that means SDRs going after uh, doing outbounds, 
And once they have a qualified opportunity, they pass it to sales who get it to a commit. And then the CSM takes over with volume of accounts, let's say 250 accounts per CSM, for example, right? So this is the motion. Now, next up, we do want to plug in their ACV. And their ACV today is at what we learn is at 75K. So this is, I think, our first aha moment. So we see misalignment there. But just like Roy um, did before with that churn analysis, it's often very helpful to do sort of see how that evolves over time. And what we actually saw with that, this particular company is that they used to have a very good go-to-market fit, right? They used to sell those 35, 40K deals, but then gradually over time, they started moving to enterprise. And this is suddenly where you, you're starting to see that mismatch. Now, this mismatch is a beautiful mismatch on a piece of paper, but I want to know, like, what, what does that look in real life, right? What, is, what does that mismatch really mean in real life? So, Groy, I'm going to pass it on to you. Yeah, for yeah let's uh, ask the crowd. What are some of the challenges that you experience going up market into the enterprise segment? Sean, I see you there. I know that you experienced this. Care yeah, to share? Yeah. Oh, 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 mute for a second. I'm happy to talk through. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, this this looks. Um, I don't know if this is us, but it looks very similar. If if, if not, so um, you know, as we were going through hyper growth, exactly what we were aiming to do is increase our ACV, go up market, get into more of an enterprise, even in some cases a named accounts type. Um, so, you know, we, we, of course, put our best AEs uh, into the biggest accounts and set a higher price and, and, and figure it out uh, and realize pretty quickly, you can see, you know, similar flows to what's on the chart here, that it, it wasn't that simple. And we ran into challenges around, you know, the win rates going down, the number of deals we were closing going down, um, and ultimately started, you know, working with, with Roey and team to really see that the rest of our motions around those AEs just wasn't equipped to, to be doing this. So the SDA team wasn't qualifying the way that they needed for this. Um, the way we were thinking about multi-threading and most of the reps didn't even really know what multi-threading was, um, wasn't, wasn't equipped for, for this new motion and go down the list all the way through the process to contracting, having the right CS delivery on the back end. So what we thought was going to be a relatively simple adjustment ended up being much larger and, and to a certain extent complex, but really just need to be thought out at kind of a broader perspective than the way we were thinking about it, which is really kind of AE motion focused. Thanks, Tom. So it's exactly what happened here. By the way, uh, this use case uh, is, is is not echo bodies to Sean, right? Just uh, numbers are nowhere near. So what we're talking about here is that our our in our client in this use case didn't realize that they're going off market. Well, they, they did realize they're they're closing bigger accounts and, and bigger deals, of course, but they didn't understand what does that mean. So they still had those SDRs calling up uh, enterprise companies, and of course, it doesn't work. And uh, we know that SDRs, BDRs are usually like entry level kind of position, and they're starting to sell to more senior people and reaching out and prospecting, in most cases, it does not work. And having CS by volume, they didn't have that. So they had CS managers manage 250 uh, accounts. They're, that was their book of business. It didn't make any sense. Like you, enterprise account expect a premium service because they're paying a premium price. In general, this is what we see. Moving up market requires new processes and skills. So if this is happening, you need to ask yourself, what do we need uh, to change here? And what you can see here is the list. I'm not gonna go over this, but um, yeah, different processes to have. Longer sales cycle, we all know this, right? Longer sales cycle, complex, talking to multiple stakeholders. We need to have processes that support that. Of course, we also need to upscale our teams. How do they talk to executive levels? How do they multi-thread their accounts? All these things that Sean just mentioned. So what we found out is that they are actually going up market and haven't realized that they need a new go-to-market motion, new processes, and new skills. All right, 
So now we gathered all these facts and findings. Let's go back to identify the, the causal factors. Sorry, to, to, to uh, conclude the root cause of everything that we're seeing. Uh, there are several techniques out there to uncover root causes. At Winning by Design, we like to use the five whys. And here's an example of that. So again, we already identified that's easy. When we look usually at numbers, this is usually the symptoms. So we usually start off with that. The symptom is, is high, high there. So the low rep performance and high churn, why is that happening? It's happening because the reps lack skills to serve the enterprise, the higher segments of the market. But why is that happening? Because we don't have a repeatable process. We talked about we need to have the right process, the right uh, uh, skills for the teams. Why is that happening? Because we're applying the wrong go-to-market motion and we haven't realized that. Why are we applying the wrong, wrong go-to-market motion, which we had the right one a few uh, uh, quarters back? It's because we have been increasing our ACV and we didn't understand how that impacts everything that we're doing. So using the five whys to get to that root, root problem. So our, it, it's not a problem in our case, but that's what's causing everything. We're going up market and our ACV is increasing. So we did this, let's talk about implementation. Before we do that, quick re recap how we got here. We started off defining the problem. We collected the data. Step three, identif identifying the causal factors. We went through the three models, the recurring revenue models, the grow, growth model, the data model, in which we did benchmarking, analyzed trend, and did advanced analytics. And then we go, went into go-to-market motions. Once we did that, we concluded the root cause. We gathered all our findings and found, found that root cause. It could be one, it could be many, of course. It usually is many. And then we are in implementation planning. This is how it looks like. This is what is the results of our entire analysis that take weeks. This is the result. This is the plan that uh, uh, we are doing that helps address the root causes. So for this example, we went and told them, hey, you need to have two distinct go-to-market motions. You need to have a team that is dedicated to selling to enterprise. You need to train and teach them. In most cases, if you're going up market, you will want to hire AEs that already have that experience. S customer success is the same thing. You, you need more experienced people that can serve bigger uh, stakeholder, a bigger amount, bigger amounts of stakeholders within a company. There we also identified we didn't go down that path, but we talked about wrong ICPs, at least in the chat. Let's revisit the ICPs. Let's get that right. Let's focus on the right ICPs in the enterprise segment. Define the ex, uh, enterprise customer journey in order to improve the retention rate. Create RACI, who does what to serve those accounts. Upskill your team, et cetera, et cetera. And we put it on a timeline, same, and we consider that as a project. And we need to find somebody from the, the company that leads that, one central person that leads that change management over time. It's the chief strategy officer or the new revenue architects that uh, are coming out of Winning by Design to implement that change over time. Once we have that implementation plan, let's talk about the next steps. Dom. Ready to take us home? Yes, let's do it. So maybe Sarah, you can spotlight me. I also see a question here in the chat. I'm completely lost and captivated by the chat. So thank you. But uh, Jonathan has a question there for an engagement like this. How long will it take? But let's talk about how you might tackle this or where do we might go from here? Like hopefully you were inspired to start applying this to your own business. So you have a couple of options here. So let's go to the next slide. Um, First, a word of caution, right? What do we see go wrong, uh, you know, when you now go home and you take all these lessons and you watch the reporting five times and maybe read Jacko's book? 
So one is that you're trying to do too much at the same time. So advice number one I will leave you with today as you're trying to translate this to your own business is break it down, right? There probably you could analyze this and you could analyze till the cows come home uh, and then come up with a list of a hundred things or even 10 things. It's too much, okay? You need to start thinking about this in an agile manner, right? Think of it as Kaizen or agile for go-to-market. You're trying to find one thing to improve in your go-to-market. Then you want to implement that, measure it, get everybody excited and pick the next thing. And it's not even 100% crucial to get the exact right place to start, right? So yes, use this sort of rough two by two. Obviously pick maybe something that has a bigger impact and that's easier to do. But again, don't get too hung up. Just get started, please. Like get started with something small. And in some of our other workshops, we've taught that even small 10 or 15% improvements, let's say you take your win rate from 30 to 33 percent right so 10 percent improvement which in that case is only three points you do that five to seven times you've just doubled your revenue without adding a single salesperson or a single lead so human brains are not good at thinking in compound impact but that's how it works so start small uh and iterate quickly and then next slide second thing to think about is um Create a coalition of the willing, create alignment. The biggest mistake people is that, that they take my advice number one and they delve right in like, nope, hold on. First, get all your go-to-market team in a room and build a coalition. So it's it's um, mindset first and behavior second. So to circle back to Harry's example, right? Like if he wants to teach his skills, uh, his kids to, to clean up after themselves, there first has to be a mindset like, why would I even care? Like, why as a kid would I care about a clean house? Well, maybe it's because it makes Harry very happy and then Harry comes home with ice cream more often or whatever it is. Like there is some, some pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There's some bigger picture reason. There's a mindset that says, okay, yes, we are going to commit as a family or in this case as a company to, what are we going to commit to? I wonder if anyone in the chat can quickly type, what are we actually going to build this coalition around? We had it in the slide, we took it off, which makes this now a brilliant quiz test. Impact, impact, uh, Ron is already talking about. The coalition is gonna be built around impact. If you can get everybody to be always thinking about how can we create more customer impact and eventually a recurring impact, and how can we adopt a framework, I recommend both eye obviously, to, uh, signify to to visualize that customer input to define that customer impact journey and to measure that customer impact journey data model that everything else you know will go much easier afterwards right team members will start to come up with ideas of things that could be improved etc so those would be our two things just uh to get started uh or to keep in mind as you get started and take these lessons home uh, but to answer the question from the chat earlier more specifically, how could we potentially help, you know, uh, because we definitely always commit to you can do it yourself or you could um, have us do this kind of go-to-market analysis for you, right? So um, when we do it for you, you have to think about, I don't know, maybe a four to six week process uh, that costs about $50,000. Dollars Again, it depends. That's why you say contact us to discuss uh, because there's sometimes a way to do a focused go-to-market diagnostic that's quicker and less expensive. And if you're in a very large company with multiple go-to-market motions, of course, that could be more, right? Um, but I actually recommend uh, following my own advice, start small, start by building that coalition and um, we can help there too. So uh, this is actually the official launch, I guess, of a new offering that we have, which is where we run these private workshops uh, where we facilitate and helping you build a coalition. So again, that's only effective if you get multiple go-to-market leaders in a room. It doesn't have to be everybody. You could start by building a coalition and initially get sales and marketing in a room or sales and customer success. But ideally, you get all your go-to-market leaders and your CEO, right? Go-to-market these days really is a, a company-wide opportunity that that the CEO should care about and lead. 
uh, but get get in a room to to just commit to each other that you're going to focus on customer impact and that you're going to uh, have an agile mindset, which also means that you're going to model and uh, measure right how to iteratively and continuously improve uh, revenue performance in this way that Harry and Rowie introduced to you. So um, again, you can do that obviously on your own, um, you know, get people in a room and pull bow tie from our website and support. We can also do it for you. And because this is a new product, we're looking for our first 10 charter member customers. I mean, beta customers, I don't know, it's a pretty mature product, so I don't want to call it beta. But if you book this by March 4th, then uh, we also have an introductory prize for that uh, of $2,500. And we'll send some more information about that if you want to take advantage of that. 